The hearing itself goes pretty much through all the beats one might expect, considering we have a dramatic story in motion. Despite being told to keep his mouth shut about the arcane, Chase does the exact opposite. This is Chase's life's work, he believes in himself, his ideas, his achievements, he is going to change the world for the better, if only he is given the chance. So it doesn't take much poking for the ice to break. Do you have anything to show for your work besides an explosion? Uh, no. It came to nothing. So you're saying your study was meaningless? It was revolutionary. Revolutionary how? All I see is a boy meddling with things he doesn't understand. I was trying to create magic. Surely we, the pioneers of science, can use it for good. We're the champions of discovery. Why fear it when we can master it? Yes, enough. This is the city of progress. Think of the wonders we could create. Let me prove- Enough! You don't understand what's at stake. Jace has violated one of the core doctrines of Piltover, and the punishment for that is banishment from the city. Yet, with the combined leniency from Heimerdinger, an appeal for mercy from Jace's mother, and the piqued interest of one very notable councilwoman, Jace's sentence is reduced. Instead of casting him out of the city outright, he gets sacked from the scientific community. He keeps his home and freedom, but loses his position and reputation lenient on paper, but for Jace personally, there is little difference. The aftermath of this incident has Jace's entire life in shambles. His work was his purpose, the dream of helping people, as he was helped years ago, to repay that kind of kindness to the world. Such desire isn't something one can just cast aside. That kind of loss of purpose leaves a person incomplete. It's a cruel itch that's impossible to scratch. And even aside from work, passion, purpose, the other half of Chase's existence is equally wounded. The trial has driven a wedge between him and his mother. The way she defended him was desperate, a step away from insanity plea. My son isn't in his right mind. His entire life he's chased an impossible dream. What he did was foolish and, and unwise, but he has a good heart. Please let him come home. Despite witnessing the miracles of Arcane firsthand alongside Chase, his mother is willing to spit on all of Chase's efforts. She cares for her baby boy above all else and would do anything to keep him safe. That's how mothers tend to be. But at the same time, that single-minded love that is reserved for only one person in the whole world goes directly against Chase's own morals. He doesn't work for himself, or his family, or even his friends. All he has ever done is for the prosperous future of everyone. And if he can't help everyone, he feels worthless. His mother doesn't share that altruistic vision, not truly not over the safety of her son. Jace, on the other hand, cares little about himself, only his vision, and the fact that his own mother won't support him and his work to the bitter end, wherever that road may lead, has him feeling betrayed. In the end, both the mother and the son are blinded by their own desires. Both of them are doing what they think is right, and morally they both have solid ground to stand on, goes to show that good intentions all around can still create conflict all the same. Desperately seeking support, Jace ends up at the gates of his old benefactor, the Kiraman family, and here we get yet another wonderful character moment slash proper introduction for Caitlyn, the delicate daughter of the family. The idea of her sitting in the rain, by the gate, waiting for Jace, is adorable. Of course he would come, Caitlyn knows this, and come what may, she wants to speak to him, as best friends do. And as usual for the show, just with a couple of well-placed lines, we get insight to the character's core. My dad says you're a misfit, and that we can't be friends anymore. So why are you out here? I'm a misfit too, I suppose. Aww. What will you do? Join the Talus Hammer business, I guess. You can't do that. 
No, I can't. I love the latter interaction especially. The snappy dismissal of joining the family business is a huge revelation about Caitlyn's inner landscape. She is projecting fiercely here. Being the little lady of a noble family isn't her ideal prospect for the future. What exactly is? Well, we'll find out sooner rather than later. But here we already have seeds planted for yet another story for yet another major character. At the same time, this works as affirming support for Jace. His place isn't in the world of industry, as in crunching numbers and making money. His place is at his atelier, creating, innovating, chasing his dream vision. This kind of dialogue is always such a joy to follow. Lines that accomplish multiple things at once, not a single moment wasted. Naturally, the noble councilwoman wants nothing to do with Chase the Pariah or his heretical research. Their relationship was all business. And to be fair, Chase did use the money coming from them for illegal experiments. That was his one big mistake, not being honest from the start. If only he had someone who shared his vision financing him, things could have gone wholly different. As things are, Cassandra owes Chase nothing, and as such, it's not unreasonable for her to cast Chase out of her sight, never to return. Like mothers do, she too is looking out for her family. A day before, Chase's life was close to ideal, and now, in one fell swoop, everything he values has been taken away. His work, his reputation, his reason to exist. He feuds with his mother, his old benefactor despises him, and his best friend is locked away from meeting him. He feels utterly alone, his life is meaningless, and in his hour of desperation, he stands on the edge of drastic solutions. Obviously he doesn't get to fulfill his plans, he is one of the main characters for one, and also other meta reasons. But theoretically, if this scene had a tragic end, I would be interested to see the kids reaction to the news that their mischief led to someone self-deleting. Anyway, Chase is surprised half to death by a surprise visitor. Am I interrupting? The hell's your problem? Victor, Heimerdinger's protege and assistant, has been following Chase's case extremely close. He was part of the initial investigation, he witnessed Chase's passion at the trial, and he has immersed himself to his research. Suffice to say, he is highly impressed by Chase and his work. I like Victor. I mean, I like the vast majority of the cast, but I really like Victor. He's one of my favorites. He's a staunch realist, he sees the world as it is, and he values people for their merits. Despite being the academic type, he isn't boring or stiff. Quite the opposite, he has a sly sarcastic way of interacting with the world. There's a lot of restricted items here, and I don't see any permits. You wanna tell me how you got them? Hey, hey, be careful with that, please. I believe someone should have said that earlier. What's that? Another list with my name on it? Actually, yes. But only because you signed your notes. Every page, I might add. A little egotistical, don't you think? This entire time I thought I needed to dampen the oscillations. The crystals will only stabilize at high frequency. You have to... Crank it! Yes. Yes, you have to crank it. His innate confidence most definitely stems from his background. He is an urchin from the Undercity, who clawed his way into high position by working hard, developing himself, and offering society something useful that being his intellect. And even though he suffers from a chronic illness that decays his body, he asks for zero pity, he knows his value, and carries himself accordingly. Similarly, as he was given the opportunity to prove himself, he wishes to extend Chase the same opportunity, a true chance to showcase the validity of his vision. When you're going to change the world, don't ask for permission. Aww. By Victor's interference, Jace's life is turned upside down yet again. 
his earnest efforts for a brighter future have resonated with the world around him, and fate has delivered him an invaluable ally. In the cool of the night, amidst the wreckage of his old life, something new and grand is formed. A lifelong friendship, two men unified by shared passion. The desire to change the world. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. And a special thanks to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, Six Stars, Danny Kicks, and Clark Daniel Ivory. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.